Okay, great. So um, I was asked to uh, introduce Professor to Shadow today, um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you to MIT. Um, um, we've known each other for about maybe 20 years almost. Yes. Uh, so 20 years since I was a postdoc and I was in metabolic ASME meetings, we've just talked about this. Um, and um, also, oh, sorry, exactly. I, do. I just forgot about that. Um, and so I, I have his, obviously have his CV here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's pretty pretty long, but I want to highlight a few things. Um, he is a really a master of using continuum mechanics physics principles in solving some really interesting, exotic, but very powerful and wide-ranging problems. I think we're going to talk about this today. Um, he is um, a really a true scholar, and has um, we've had some really great discussions um, over, over the years. And, and because he's um, such, doing such amazing work, he's been recognized with many, many awards from ASME, he's a member of the NAE, um, he won the SES um, um, Rice Medal, the Charles Russ Medal from ASME, the Guggenheim, has distinguished professorship um, at the University of Houston, and, and many, many other things. Um, but um, the, um, I think we're just going to keep it short and, and listen to you, as we said earlier. That's, that's probably the most, most interesting thing. Um, but Again, thank you very much for coming here, um, and um, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Pretty Th thank you, Marcus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, it's really great to visit the MIT campus again. I've been here a, f a few times, and many friends here, so I really enjoy the discussions. And in particular, I've kind of grew up uh, reading papers of many of the faculty here, including a couple in the audience, so it's a real honor to give this uh, talk. So what I'm going to talk about today is a work that I started really when I was a junior faculty. It's one of my favorite topics to uh, present, because maybe it was one of my first big projects when I uh, was an assistant professor. I just moved to Houston, uh, and I was trying to collaborate, getting, get some money from NASA. And they were very interested in, in multifunctional materials. And um, at, in one of those meetings, I proposed a deceptively simple idea to them. Uh, is it possible to create? piezoelectric materials without using piezoelectric materials. And if you think about it, it's somewhat an odd question, trying to get something out of nothing, right? And that quest led me to this topic that I will talk about. Now, of course, over the years, I've done a lot of work in this uh, field. And uh, when I started, there were very few people involved. And so it's, the field has sort of blossomed over the years. And um, usually, when I would give a talk on this, I would talk about everything we have done. But I'm going to do something a little bit different. I will give you an overview, a summary to establish context, and then we'll quickly go into open questions, or what I think are the open problems, and some ongoing work. So I hope that format is a little bit more interesting. OK, so I think most people in the audience do not need any introduction to this. But I'll just go over it briefly. A piezoelectric material is something where if you apply an electric, electrical stimulus, you produce mechanical deformation. And this is really important. If you apply a mechanical deformation, you will produce an electrical uh, response, right? But this the idea is very simple, but it's really captivated the imagination of engineers and scientists. And there are now entire journals dedicated to this field. They go by the name of smart materials and so forth. And, uh, and the one reason is, of course, it has many interesting applications, right? Just go, we'll go over a few, a few of them. They can be used in consumer items, for example, like lighters. Many of you might have seen barbecue lighters. So you press on it, the hammer hits a small piezoelectric crystal, a spark comes out. Very mundane application. There are others, microphones, speakers, even tennis rackets. You, uh, back in the early 2000s, there are people who started embedding piezoelectric fibers in tennis rackets. So when you would uh, play tennis, the ball would hit, and it would convert the mechanical force into electricity and provide a forward force, or reduce rattling, which was the number one reason for player fatigue. Right? In fact, uh, when Andre Agassi uh, reached the French Open quarterfinals, he was using one of those rackets. He lost that, that game, but that was not because of the racket. It's now it became kind of a standard for the players at that time. And you can imagine energy harvesting. So this is where this comes in. The fact that you can apply mechanical deformation and get electrical response, it means you can imagine that this, these materials could be used for energy harvesting. You can stick this material, slap it on a vibrating structure, and convert the mechanical uh, field into electricity, right? So, so you, for example, you can use it for wireless sensing. In 
2012 London Olympics, they actually paved the walkways with piezoelectric patches. So when, people, when uh, pedestrians would walk, they would light up the, uh, the, the road, right? Uh, in fact, in MIT itself, there were some interesting experiments in this. I, I was surprised to find out from Ken, or maybe it was Ken, right? Maybe uh, that there's still this Institute of Nano Soldiers going on. Or oh, you were, <laughs> Carlos. And uh, at least in th those days, they, they were doing some stuff where they would put in piezoelectric fiber in the shoes of soldiers. And the idea was that the soldiers, American soldiers in particular, carry so much weight that they will start walking around and charging all their electronics and batteries and whatnot. The idea didn't work out very well. I think somebody showed that you had to hike for like a few days to charge ha half of your iPhone. But the, uh, so it's not going to solve your energy problem, but the idea is that when you're talking about small power sources, small devices, wireless sensors where you don't want to change batteries, this is a great way to convert uh, mechanical uh, energy into electricity, right? So pacemakers is a good example, sonars, and on micro devices. Whenever you, wherever you need precise control over mechanical motion, like AFM, artificial muscles, robotic arms. So a lot of applications of uh, such kind of materials if, you, if they're designed well, right? So here's now, uh, let me talk about absence of piezoelectricity. So I'm gonna talk about crystals. So let's take a, a cartoon of a crystal a fairly representative, for example, of sodium chloride. So you have uh, the center of positive charges here and the center of negative charges also there. So there's no dipole moment. So in the undeformed configuration, the polar electrical polarization is zero. Now if I deform it uniformly, my centers of positive and negative charges will continue to coincide. So there'll still be produced no dipole moment. And what we say is then kind of a textbook example of a centrosymmetric crystal, you cannot produce piezoelectricity. And this is centrosymmetric. So uh, you will have no electrical fields. You can deform it till the cows come home. Now here's another cartoon. Now it's undeformed configuration. The centers of positive and negative charges coincide. But now if I deform it, they will separate. And, you base, and this is a t kind of a classical signature of a non centrosymmetric crystal. And if you like mathematics, group theory, then in fact you can easily show that you have electrical polarization linked with the strain tensor through a third order property tensor. And third order odd tensors do not exist in centrosymmetric crystals. So that's why only certain crystal structures can show piezoelectricity. This is all standard condensed matter physics. But then here's what we can do, if we can think about. What if we apply non-uniform deformation? We strain gradients. So even if you have a centrosymmetric crystal, which is non-piezoelectric, and so this is zero, your strain gradients will couple through a fourth order property tensor. And that's what we call flexoelectricity. So idea is that if you have non-uniform deformation, you can produce electrical polarization in any material, any dielectric, any insulating materials. That's, a, that's basically what flexoelectricity really is. Now, so fourth order tensors are universal. They'll exist in all dielectrics, silicon, sodium chloride, whatnot. Symmetry tells us this must exist. This phenomenon has to exist. It doesn't tell us it has to be large. So for example, mu could exist, but could be very, very small. And actually it turns out, unfortunately, it is very, very small in general. general. So this phenomena is indeed an exotic phenomena uh, of somewhat minor significance in general, but it's interesting because you could, in principle, produce electricity in any material provided you apply non-uniform deformation. And in fact, uh, there was, there is some limited, there was in, in the early days when I started working on it, some experimental corroboration. Unfortunately, in materials with very high dielectric cons uh, uh, constants like ferroelectrics themselves, which often are piezoelectric to begin with. So that was maybe not as interesting, at least from my point of view anyway. But uh, there was some experimental evidence of this. But in particular, if you, if you do quantum calculation on something as simple as a graphene ribbon, which is just carbon, manifestly non-piezoelectric, if you just bend it, you actually can just simple DFT show that you will create a polarization autoplane. So that was one of the more interesting things that came out of in the early 2000s. 
So here's the idea that I was talking about in the beginning, which is what I, how I started this uh, project. So imagine now you have a chunk of material that is non-piezoelectric. So of course, if you apply some mechanical stress to it, you will get nothing, no electricity. Now I imagine that I, without telling you, I put an inclusion in it, also non-piezoelectric. But now you will create strain gradients here, locally. And locally, it means because of flex electricity, you'll cause electrical polarization. So and as long as your average is non-zero, you just took two non-piezoelectric materials, put them together, and created a piezoelectric material. So that's, that was basically the idea that we uh, uh, came up with. It is, you see this particle is uh, triangular. And uh, if you have ever seen uh, presentations on composites, you always see nice ellip ellipsoidal particles or circular particles. So this is not accidental. There's a reason for it. If I had a spherical or ellipsoidal particle, I will still produce local polarization because there are strain gradients at the interface, just the classical HLV solution. But if I integrate it around the whole thing, it's zero. Integrating any vector around this symmetrical structure will be zero. So you need to actually break geometrical non uh, central symmetry as well. The other point is that the strains Elasticity is sort of a size independent, right? Roughly, it's continuum mechanics. But when you have strain gradients in it, that skills with size. So we, we expect larger effects at the smaller length scales. In, right? So putting it all together, here's a recipe for creating something out of nothing, a piezoelectric material without using any piezoelectric materials. You need high elastic and dielectric contrast to have larger gradients, small size, non-central symmetric shape, because you cannot use rectangles, ellipsoids, spheres. You have to use non-central symmetric shapes, heptagons, triangles, and so forth, uh, if you want regular shapes. And optimum volume fraction, which I'll explain in a minute. So I will skip the math. I just want to say that I, in the beginning, when I started working on electromagnetics and deformable media, I was very, very confused. Maybe I am still am a little bit, but I definitely was very confused when I started. But uh, eventually, we worked out a reasonable mathematical framework, which I kind of, uh, it works both, both for nonlinear uh, deformation as well as uh, small, elastic, small strain elasticity. Here is an example of a calculation. I'm taking a barium titanium thin film in its non piezoelectric phase, a thin film, and all I've done is dug some holes in it. Of course, air is non piezoelectric, the material is non piezoelectric, and what I'm plotting here is polarization normalized with respect to quartz, a well-known piezoelectric material, and the hole size. The volume fraction is fixed. And of course, when the size of the holes is large, the material is non-piezoelectric, you get nothing. But for small sizes, you can almost achieve 80% of what quartz would give you. So, right? And this is remarkable in the sense that all I've done is taken a thin film and put holes in it, and it just made it into piezoelectric, right? Uh, what, do I, what did I mean by optimum volume fraction? And this might be of interest to people who work on topology optimization. Uh, the, so when we deal with classical composites homogenization, if you have a soft material, you want to make it stiff, you keep on dumping hard materials, and it becomes stiffer and stiffer. So it's sort of monotonic relationship between uh, put more stiffness, you get higher, stiffer material. Here it is very different. Imagine you have very little of the second phase. So the material is non-piezoelectric, so you get almost zero average polarization. Now imagine you, go, you have access of second phase particles or holes, whatever yet. So you again will get zero because the materials are all non-piezoelectric. So this must be exist an optimum volume fraction. And this is, I believe, a signature of gradient coupling. Whenever you have coupling of properties through gradient effects, you will always have an optimum volume fraction. You cannot just keep on increasing your number of particles or something, and you'll get more better response. That, that's what typically happens in plasticity or elasticity. It doesn't work here. You actually have to fine tune it to the right. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I believe this effect was never even discovered accidentally. You would need to not only have non centrosmetic shaped particles. More, normally, material scientists don't do that. They always have all these nice, beautiful shaped particles, and they have to be distributed. If they're randomly arranged, they all cancel out as well, right? And of course, you need to be in some sort of a optimum volume fraction range. Sorry. Anyway, so this is, uh, and this just calculation will just show the same thing, what I was just mentioning. 
So um, when we presented these results in the beginning, it was, uh, there was a lot of skepticism. And I was a junior faculty, and you know, when you, you get challenged, uh, your theory gets challenged, uh, what I should have done was done some experiments, hopefully collaborate, but what I did was just did more theory to prove them wrong. So that was not a very good strategy, but that's, uh, as I said, that's what I did. So, uh, so except I changed my theory to quantum calc uh, DFT calculations uh, in the hopes they'll be more convincing. Uh, uh, so what we did was, in that case, it, it was definitely a sexier title we came up with, but uh, so it was definitely a well-cited paper. But what we did was uh, took graphene ribbons. You have to prepare them carefully because when you prepare the ribbons, you have to terminate them just right, otherwise they will become metallic. So you had to make sure they were insulating. So three samples, uh, pristine circular holes, triangular holes. And then you, so you had to, when you create the defects, you had to rerun the calculations to make sure that they remained uh, insulating. Otherwise, you won't get anything out of it. But if you do this carefully, and we get some really interesting results. Here's polarization that you produce, the average polarization for the entire ribbon versus mechanical deformation. And sure enough, for the circular holes and the pristine, you get nothing. And for the triangular holes, you almost get a telltale signature of piezoelectricity, a linear relationship between strain and polarization. So that one, we were happy with the result. It's, uh, in my opinion, that was, in, that, in those days, it was early on, one of the thinnest piezoelectric material you could make. We uh, started collaborating with some experimentalists eventually to see if we could make it uh, happen in real life, and it was just, it was just really, really difficult. You know, uh, when, when you, it's kind of easy to create these structures in MATLAB, but uh, it was not that easy in those days to, you couldn't make them in their real life and uh, uh, make those experiments. I, I think I, my collaborator, her uh, student, uh, uh, almost didn't graduate because they were trying to do this. Uh, luckily, I did c collaborate with an experimentalist in Rice University who, who gave us some cooperation. I will mention that in a minute. So what else have we done? So there are many things. For one thing is uh, in collaboration with Professor Ajayan and Jiang Yu, Jiang Yu Li group, we were able to actually, they were able to create a material that self-assembled with these triangle holes, uh, graphene nitride, and turns out that they were able to do some PFM image uh, calc uh, experiments to prove it, prove what our theory was saying. That was a nice uh, collaboration. Uh, I was able to persuade another experimentalist to, sh uh, to show a size effect in ferroelectrics due to flexible electricity, that was also nice. And then we had many other speculative works related to energy harvesting and, and, and nanocapacitors and many other topics over the years. So with that sort of as context and summary of what flexible electricity is and what, how I, I, my work on this started, let me talk about what are some ongoing things and uh, uh, open questions, at least that I think are interesting questions, right? The first is, a computational framework. At least in the initial days, we, it was a gradient theory with electrical fields. I'm not a computational person, so I, I thought it was an interesting area for the finite element people to work on. And in fact, indeed, over the last many years, there's a flurry of work on coming up with finite element schemes to handle the, the numerical implementation of continuum theories. Uh, borrowing, actually, methods that people have developed for doing strain gradient elasticity or plasticity as well. But now you have to do coupling with electromagnetic fields, and often in the context of soft matter. So this is, a f this is something that has been ongoing. Perhaps it's already saturated, but I don't know. Uh, but definitely a, a topic that has, seems to get attention. The second open area or ongoing uh, area is a rigorous homogenization theory of flex electricity. Again, it's a, not your standard composites where you can homogenize uh, like elasticity or even plasticity, you're dealing with this gradient coupling. So that has its uh, interesting idiosyncrasies that you have to deal with. Uh, of course, there's ample scope for op topology optimization, and in particular, finding manufacturable optimal geometries. What we did were very simple work using uh, uh, simple analytical formulas, but uh, there's certainly scope for more. Interestingly, from an experimental point of view, finding the flexoelectric tensor is not easy because you have to go down to small scales and you have to apply gradients, right? So easiest way to do is bending. 
So you would have to go to small skills, apply bending, and then make tech measurements. But in bending will give you, might give you one, essentially one per constant. So you, you, for the complete characterization, you will need to find multiple ways of deformation variance. So not an easy problem. Turns out the atomistic calculation is also not so simple. So the, uh, again, you, you cannot use periodic boundary conditions easily, right? Because you have to apply gradients. So if you try to do DFT, your graphene ribbons is okay, but if you want to have bigger crystals, you cannot use periodicity. So uh, you, it, then your computational problems come in. There, I'm sure there are ways around it. People do it. If you start using molecular dynamics, again, when I started working on it, the potentials were terrible, uh, which could handle uh, polarizability of materials. There was, uh, in Caltech, Godard's group tried to develop some good potentials for these kind of things. And uh, uh, we, in fact, used a little bit of work with Tahir Shevin at a and But this was, finding finite te temperature properties uh, of this phenomena was actually an interesting challenge. I think to date, I think this remains somewhat inadequately addressed. And now we're talking about other areas that uh, slowly people are getting into. Energy harvesting experiments, architected metamaterials, we just spoke to Carlos, his kind of stuff he's doing. Now people are trying to make architecture metamaterials and you're exploiting flexoelectricity to get a big, really electromechanical response. I'm not involved in this work myself, but I'm reading those stuff with interest and that's becoming an emerging area. Of course, then actual applications also. Finally, and this is where I will focus a little bit more on is uh, soft materials and biology, right? That I believe is, in my opinion, that is now, the, uh, for my work, that's now the big focus. I am more and more now getting into that, that sort of uh, realm in terms of both application of flexoelectricity or in general uh, electromagnetics. So the basic premise really is that uh, the strain or strain gradients both will scale as one over elastic modulus. And there is, seem to be some evidence that for polymers or hard materials, the flexoelectric constants are about of the same order of magnitude, roughly speaking. But the elastic modulus is off by three orders of magnitude, right? The polymers, soft polymers, they are way more softer. So we can produce larger strain gradients in soft materials as opposed to uh, hard materials. So that was the basic premise, that, we, that, that flexoelectricity would be of more importance than soft materials. So I have since slowly got, gotten away from hard materials in this context. And we uh, don't need much, much motivation to know why soft materials are so important. This uh, skull is moving through these rubber bands, which are being electrically actuated, this kind of motion is not possible with hard materials, right? You need soft materials. And of course, ideally, you want this mechanical deformation through uh, some stimulus, in this case, electrical stimulus. And of course, another motivation, if you like, is down the, down the river, I guess, uh, Zigang's group, where they had this uh, stretchable speaker made from a soft material, and uh, uh, there's no way you can do this with a hard material at all. Now, the interesting thing is that the, both the things that I showed you, the rubber bands uh, moving the jaw and the, what Zigang has been doing with uh, his soft materials, none of them are actually piezoelectric. So the, the mechanism is in totally, uh, totally different, uh, but it leads to something. Uh, it can be used to exploit it in an interesting way. So it turns out that there's another form of uh, universal coupling like flexoelectricity. It's the Maxwell stress. And this is present in all dielectrics, all insulating materials, including the, the wood in front of you. you. If you apply an electric field, the material will deform proportional to electric field square. All materials will. All, all, uh, but there's no converse effect. You can, apply, uh, you can apply mechanical deformation as much as you want. You will not produce electricity. But applying an electric uh, field uh, you will produce some mechanical deformation proportional to E square. So, so what it means is that if you take a thin film, you apply an electric field across it with an electric, it will, it will become thinner, right? This though is nonlinear in nature. It requires very high voltage, and deformation is not reversed with electric field. It cannot really easily use it for energy harvesting either, right? But it is universal. The, if, the effect is so weak that you, it hardly matters. So the material in front of most hard materials, will, you will barely be able to 
experimentally detect the deformation if you try it. But with soft rubbers like silicone, they can deform. I mean, you can, uh, people have shown experimentally you can deform. I, mean, I think Xuan He himself has done it experiments. You can deform like several hundred percent. You can deform these materials, uh, soft materials. So here's the basic idea we came up with was uh, the, using this uh, Maxwell stress, and as long as you, can, you deposit charges and dipoles, you can actually take an ordinary soft rubber material and make it piezoelectric-like. So these are invisible charges and dipoles. You're not talking about com actual composite. That's all you need. And let me motivate this a little bit. So these materials are called electrodes. They were discovered, at, well, perhaps going back even uh, 100 years ago, but sometime in the 80s, they came of age by people in Austria and Germany. And they took this polypropylene foams or polymer foams. They would stick a needle in it, break the air down electrically, so they would deposit some charges. So you have this, in this foamy material, charges deposited. So there, it doesn't change the elastic modulus much. In fact, it makes it even softer if you have foamy material. But it turns out when they actually do experiments on it, it behaves like a piezoelectric material. Not only that, it creates this piezoelectric coefficient is really, really high. These are really soft. Ordinary soft materials, by the way, are not piezoelectric at all. They cannot be. They don't have that kind of a, a symmetry structure to do that. Uh, usually, most of them, soft materials. But these, all you're doing is putting some charges, and they have this interesting effect. And here's the mechanism behind it that I can like to explain. So imagine two soft materials, and you're somehow able to deposit charge between the layers. You have to stabilize it. So the, here's the thing I want to say. It's a quasi-permanent charge or dipole state. Intrinsically, it's unstable, right? Because the charges will want to decay away to the surface. It's a, non it's a metal stable state. But the interface stabilizes it. And in fact, uh, people have calculated that it's time constant to decay. For some of the materials, it's like 100 years at room temperature. So it stays fairly stable. It won't decay uh, if you use the right materials and interfaces. So the energy barrier is high enough for them that you will stabilize it. So let's say you stabilize charge in this body, in this two-layer material. Both of them are soft material. Here's what will happen. Here's mechanical deformation. Here's electrical field. Based on the Maxwell stress, the quadratic relationship, we expect a parabola. So strain behaves as E square. It's compressive, so we are, it's inverted down. Now, if I have these charges in, uh, embedded in them, you essentially have a residual field in, in some sense. What you, all what you do is you end up sh shifting the curve a little bit. And you will pick a linear component. It's actually very easy to see. Uh, we have a theory, I won't go into details about it, but you can, if you solve this simple bilayer problem, you can do it analytically, it's very trivial. If I apply an electrical field, a voltage to it, delta V, my change in total thickness will be proportional to the charge square that I already have in the material, Same, like, sort of like Maxwell stress of the residual field. I will have the Maxwell stress to the applied field, and I will pick up the linear term in the middle. Because this is, and this, this is where I would like to uh, say a few words about continuum mechanics, that uh, if I started with a linear theory, elasticity, for example, have residual fields, I will get nothing if you homogenize it. You, you, I will not get any effect. If I start with a nonlinear theory, and then if you want, you can linear, nonlinearize it around the residual state, then you'll pick up this effect. So the, uh, if, if some of you are in the mechanics area, I will say that paying attention to uh, that, that sort, of sort of thing that are buried in the textbooks, old textbooks like Malvern, are important. Uh, and you will, uh, homo the homogenization of these things are all based on the fact that you have to start with the full nonlinear theory, otherwise you don't get anything out of it. But from this, we can extract a kind of a piezoelectric constant, if you will. These are the thickness, the dielectric constant. And the whole result is proportional to the difference in the shear modulus. So you have to, you need some elastic contrast, and then you can create a essentially piezoelectric material out of just nothing, really. You're putting charges in it. Um, here's some numerical result. Uh, you can, we can get almost 1.5 times of barium titanate uh, with, with this bilayer concept. And in fact, uh, 
I, we modeled a foamy material as well and uh, compared with experiments of other people and we, our theory works really, really well. We are able to uh, predict experiments uh, quite accurately uh, of other people. And in fact, uh, depending on the kind of material and foams you use, you can get almost six or seven times larger piezoelectric coefficient than some of these hard materials. I'm gonna sp uh, skip some of the, uh, couple of slides. Uh, we, uh, uh, th that sort of pertains to some fundamental uh, results in homogenization. Happy to talk about it with, uh, after the talk. So what are the open issues in this? The first one is combination of electrics with flexoelectricity to exploit size effects. We actually have done the modeling. The results we get are so fantastical that uh, we never publish them because we, we don't believe them. We, we're not sure whether they're right or not. At least somebody has to do the experiments. Now I'm, we, I have enough collaborators. I think we will try to do that uh, at some point. Uh, but this is something that we, I'm trying to work right now with a few collaborators to do it, to combine flex electricity with uh, electrodes to see if we can engineer a very large response. The second is, charge stability. This is kind of, I think, the critical bottleneck. What we would like to do is make electrodes out of really soft material, like elastomers, like PDMS, silicone. The problem there is, you have a, if, you take, if I take polypropylene or Teflon, I make it a foamy and I can put the charges in there, I can stabilize them for, as I said, hundreds of years for, at room temperature. But if I take elastomer and I put charges, they will decay in three days. So I will, I will start with the piezoelectric material today and three days later, it's just a piece of rubber. So how to stabilize charge in a really, really soft material like a rubber, like elastomer, it's, it's a, that's a hard problem. And I, uh, of course, it's a chemistry problem, and I, I, I think I don't know how to solve it. it that will be good to actually do quantum calculations in it, but I have not been able to. I'm no longer doing competition much, but there are people like Julie who could perhaps think about how it is possible to take soft materials and do quantum level modeling and stabilize charges. That's a, inter that's a different, altogether different design uh, problem at the material level, but I haven't uh, been able to make much headway with this. But this is, a, I think it's a truly a critical problem, not only for this topic, but for many other uh, topics. How do you stabilize charge, especially in soft material? A lot of, a lot of avenues will open up if that happens. And of course, coupling of flex electricity with ionic motion. Some work, I'm starting to see some work appearing in this direction, and especially in the context of thermoelectrics. It's still initial stages of this, but there could be some interesting work here done. Uh, one of my former postdocs is now trying to work in this, but mostly blank area. And then finally, the last topic, which I have done something, is what are the mechanisms of flex electricity, the micro mechanism of soft matter? And the idea being is that if once you know the mechanism, then you can perhaps design soft material with, say, very large flex electricity to begin with, right? And that one, we have done some recent work. Uh, this just came out where we are able to design, a, say, a polymer unit cell with the chain level to come up with a very large flex electric properties uh, from the get-go. And it turns out it has to do with how you arrange the chain so that you have maximal quadruple moment, not the dipole moment, because overall the material is non-polar. Polar but quadruple moment, and we, we use statistical mechanics to design, do the design, and we get some good results. This has to be yet to be implemented experimentally. Okay, uh, how's what I'm doing for time, Kosa? Uh, okay, good. So, uh, so in, in biology also, there's a, you know, this phenomena plays, can play a very interesting role. So in our bodies, especially if talking about uh, cell or tissue level, we, we're talking about soft, squishy stuff, right? So there's no, no avenues for it to be piezoelectric, right? Our cells, for example. But this, I believe, other than the ionic motion, this is one of the key mechanisms uh, underpinning electromechanical coupling in, at the cell level. Right? You can imagine that if you have a cell membrane is bent, it will perfectly fits that bent graphene paradigm that we talked about. And indeed, for such a squishy, iso essentially a fluid membrane, you will have a polarization vector normal to it, and F is the flexoelectric constant, and kappa is the curvature, right? And that, therein lies your electromechanical coupling at the cell level. And here, the work that we explored and did is uh, related to a hearing mechanism. So 
the idea one of so one uh, the basic premise is that our hearing mechanism is uh, mediated by our oscillations of our hair cells in the outer, outer, outer hair cells right so you have sound waves coming in they, they you have this small stereocilia which are the small hair like objects on top of the hair cells they uh, they start oscillating because of the sound waves they ion channels start opening and closing. When the ions move in and out, that changes the electrical field in those cells. That, because of flexoelectricity, there's now a mechanical shape change as well. And so it's a back and forth coupling that goes on between them. And that sets that oscillation, the dynamical oscillation, starts running very close to a bifurcation phenomena called Hopf bifurcation. And Hopf bifurcation, what it does it is, is basically you are, reach a limit cycle. So if I have a very weak signal, it will amplify it until it will reach some sort of a saturated limit cycle. If it is a very strong amplitude, it will downgrade it. So that's how our hearing, hearing mechanism works, a very inter interesting phenomena. So we came up with a model of how important flexoelectricity is to this. In fact, without this electromechanical coupling, we won't be able to hear. In fact, it amplifies the sound we hear, that we hear. This mechanism amplifies the sound. So this was a work done with collaboration with Brownell at uh, Baylor School of Medicine. And uh, I believe it's being received well uh, because we, uh, th this kind of coupling was central to explaining some of the things we observed. Uh, and most interesting to me personally, and I, this paper just got appeared like a few weeks ago. Uh, it was uh, uh, in, under embargo until then is that the question that we said, okay, now that we know this, can we address a question that is very personal to me? Uh, why do some people hear music better than others? I always have uh, been passionate about music. And uh, when I first bought my piano 10 years ago, I, I, I heard, I've heard twinkle, twinkle like all of you, but I couldn't figure out the notes on the piano unless somebody gave me the shit music. But my wife, who's completely untrained in music, she could sit down and listen to any Bollywood song, and then even though she's not non-Indian, and she could crank out the entire song, right? So clearly, and she's not trained in music, so clearly she had a better ear for music, right? So the question we asked was, is there something physiological going on in our ears that makes her, you know, uh, better at listening to music, distinguished pitches? So I asked that question, and the answer is, I believe, in the affirmative. Uh, this will be an entire new talk by itself, but if you're interested, the paper is on my website, and now we, have, we do have a theory that, sure, training will make a big impact, and there's a lot of neurological stuff going on, but there is something physiological in our ears, and then based on your bending modulus of your hair cells, based on the flexoelectric properties, that will make one person superior to the other when it comes to discriminating between pitches and so forth. Okay, here's my last topic, and I uh, actually kind of a little bit added this uh, because I had a long discussion with Lalit about this, so I wanted to add a little bit about this uh, on there. Uh, I think I still have some time. Yeah, so it looks tangential, this topic, but actually it is somewhat related to some of the ideas I've talked about. Right. So, so magnetoelectricity is also a very interesting phenomena. It's basically an ability of a material to magnetize under an electric field or Conversely, you can polarize it if you uh, apply a magnetic field, right? So an immediate application that is very intuitive to me is wireless energy harvesting. So you, if you had a cell phone with a magnetoelectric material in it, and I could apply a large magnetic field, I could power your cell phone. We, don't, we cannot do that right now. We don't have that, that strong uh, magnetoelectric material. But in principle, that would be the idea. You can do wireless energy har harvesting, right? You can uh, power something. And I think uh, also sometimes called tetherless action. Of course, it means, you, yeah. So there are other applications. Some of them I uh, frankly don't even understand. But I will, uh, let me say a few other words about this phenomenon. This effect does exist in, natu in nature, but it's found in only a few materials, in multiferroics typically. And it's a highly contradictory property because to get polarized, you need to be a dielectric, and magnetic uh, materials are often metallic. So it's not really a, E easy thing to coexist. But there are some materials that in it, it does exist. The problem is that those coupling constants that relate magnetic and electric fields are low. 
and in fact, even lower at room, temp uh, room temperature, and they almost all, invariably, all of them are hard materials. So if you desire soft matter applications, soft robotics and whatnot, you cannot use them. There are many applications of this phenomenon. As I said, some of them I don't fully understand, multiple state memory, spintronics, and so forth. One of them I do understand, of course, wireless energy harvesting. There's another one that is e uh, easier to understand is a biomedical application. For example, these were experiments done by a group uh, where they, they actually took magnetoelectric particles, put drugs in them, coated them with some sort of antigen so that they will get close to the cell, and when they apply an uh, electric uh, magnetic field and the body doesn't get hurt by magnetic fields, unlike the electric fields, that's a good thing, it creates local electric fields. So locally, it will create small holes in the phenomena known as electroporation. And the particles then enter. Then they will apply another magnetic field, a larger one, to release the drugs. So because this, the drugs are bound together by some mechanism, which then you can overcome that by applying a higher magnetic field. So they actually showed ex uh, extremely good results by trying to remove ovarian cancer this way. Uh, they, they, this is the experiments done. The problem is these particles are no good for you. These are, uh, these are uh, you know, the, your, the kind of particles you go in the body, you'll probably, if you, you can, cancer might get cured, but you probably die of the particles eventually. <laughs> so, uh, but you, you will, it'll be good to have soft materials that can actually do the same thing. So how do people now make magnetoelectric materials? Either you take one that exists in nature, which I said is very, very hard to find, or they are hard materials, or people make composites. You can uh, marry a magnetostructive material with a piezoelectric material, hard materials both, and you can create an indirect effect if you like. Uh, but again, you're dealing with hard materials, with low couplings, and all these issues. So here's our idea that we came up with, which is, I think, very, very simple and very robust. So Take a dielectric, simple dielectric material, nothing else, like a piece of rubber, and you apply an electric field on it. Basically, attach a battery to it. So because of Maxwell's stress, it will deform. It will compress a little bit. Right? Now you apply a magnetic field on top of the, that. It will deform further because of magnetic Maxwell stress as long as its permeability is different than vacuum. So we have to ensure that. And we can ensure that by even put, sprinkling a little bit of iron oxide particle, if you like. Not to make it hard, just enough. And what will happen is that because it's already deformed, the electrical field lines will convect with the deformation. And you will be able to measure the difference between the, the electric field that was existed before and later on. And that, that forms basically just exactly like a magnetoelectric effect, right? So it, it, it uh, is based on st strain mediation. It has to be soft material because you need large deformations to do that. But if it's soft enough material, that's exactly what will happen. So this is the basic idea that we have. And it actually works fairly well. Uh, in, in particular, and I, we have some experiments on this as well, which I'll mention in a minute. But before we were able to convince uh, my former postdoc to do the experiments, what we tried to do was see if we could explain something in nature. Like uh, there are many animals that have, they can sense magnetic fields. We have birds that can detect, uh, they navigate. We have sharks, uh, you know, bats, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Some of them, some of, their, some of the animals have, in fact, almost like a low resolution GPS. They can navigate part of the earth just by, by seeing what the magnetic field is around them. So it's actually pretty, pretty inter interesting. So here was our model. This, by the way, is a very controversial topic. There are a lot of people with lots of ideas, and, and some of them are probably very good and right, but none of them can really explain how the magnetic field gets converted into electricity, because they've never been able to find any magnetic receptors in the body. Now, if the cells were magnetoelectric, they could explain it, but nobody thinks cells are magnetoelectric. So here's our model. So, Back to this thing, as long as the material is soft and the magnetic permeability is different than vacuum and there is a pre-existing electric field, my contention is the material behaves like a magnetoelectric material. And that is exactly what happens in a cell. Here's a biological cell, a schematic of it. It does have a residual electric field. There is always some sort of a resting potential across the membrane, always. 
Material is soft, so that is satisfied. The only thing we don't know is for sure if its magnetic permeability is different than vacuum or not. And normally it is not. It's the same as, you know, it's essentially the same as the vacuum. But it turns out in some, many of the animals who are uh, sensitive, they find some iron oxide particles in the cells. So, so the, the, the fluid is, the permeability is different, right? So all these conditions are satisfied and we can actually create a mathematical model and we get a very nice results. So I don't know what the magnetic permeability is of the material, but I'm producing the electrical field change under the action of the Earth's terrestrial magnetic field. And this is the neuronal threshold. And even with modest uh, values of permeability more than vacuum, I can easily exceed the detection level. Uh, so that was our model. I thought it was really simple, robust, how nature does it. it we got canned by the reviewers, or multiple reviewers. I think we, we got rejected six or seven times uh, in the end. Uh, finally got published. Uh, it turns out that it's not easy to convince biologists. Uh, biophysicists are easier, not biologists. Biophysicists, uh, and I think mainly because we didn't have, we did not have any experiments. And how you know, I'm not. I can. I can. You know, you are lucky enough to do the theory, let alone experiments. We never really did. But uh, I was really happy about this work uh, in the end. Uh, so what we said, we cannot do experiments to prove this, but we will try to see if we can use the basic idea to make artificial materials. Right. Uh, and before I show you the results, let me just briefly talk about the open issues. The first open issue, we have to, can we create an artificial soft magnetoelectric material based on this principle? And a few, uh, several months ago, this was my bullet. I'm happy to say that we actually successfully made it in the lab. We, using exactly some ideas, what we did was we did not attach, we did not attach a battery to it for pre-existing electric field. We just made it an electrode. We just put charges in it. That produces the residual field. And using the same idea, we are able to take silicon rubber and make it into a, uh, I think it was PDMS, sorry, PDMS, and we were able to make it a magnetoelectric material. That was our, I believe, one of the first soft magnetoelectric materials that we were able to make, we made. And it works, exactly as we, our model would say. Uh, combining magnetic field and flexoelectricity is an open area, we now, it has not been done and then explaining other biological phenomena. I should mention that Xuan He uh, came up with this great idea about hard magnetic soft materials, which uh, I think is becoming uh, fairly uh, very popular. We actually, in fact, in collaboration with him, we recently used that idea to also make a magnetoelectric material, and that is orders of magnitude better than using the principle we mentioned, showed here. And I think that is now, uh, that hopefully will be a new line of work that emerges out of it. Okay, with this, I would like to just thank that, I just uh, state that most of the recent work was done by my former postdoc, who is now an associate professor, my student, Sana, who is the one, she was the one who worked on the animal magnetoreception. reception. She got, she got her favorite rejected six, seven times. She was very disillusioned. Uh, I, she had a baby, uh, she was pregnant, she had a baby, we started going to uh, school by the time the paper got accepted. Uh, and uh, what's that? Oh, and uh, this is my long-standing collaborator who has kind of taught me a lot of things about electromagnetics and mathematics, so I'd like to acknowledge him as well. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Pradeep. Um, we have many questions I'm suspecting. Yes, please, go ahead. One thing that's puzzled me for years is how electrodes are maintained against natural cosmic radiation. Why doesn't, why doesn't the ionization in the atmosphere and the and, and materials need them to run down? You said a hundred year time comes, and how can something be maintained for a hundred years? Uh, well. So nobody has then obviously done the experiments for 100 years. So what they do is they do an accelerated test. So they will, they, they have a model for how the charges would decay to the surface, right? So they, they will do an experiment at slightly higher temperature than room temperature. It's kind of an Arrhenius kind of a relationship. And then based on that, they'll extrapolate how long it stays stable. So definitely, there are electric devices in the market right now, by the way. Uh, they will definitely stay stable for several years. Uh, but the prediction would be that they, for some of the materials we're talking about, they will stay stable for 100 years through, they're extrapolating it based on their accelerated testing. They're doing testing for only maybe a few weeks, 
but from that they extrapolate. Uh, yes, the charges want to leak out. And in fact, for elastomer, they do. You, you make one and three days later it's gone. But yeah. <laughs> Question. Yes, but the inter interface stabilizes them because it produces some sort. Of, it uh, leads to some sort of energy barrier for the charge hopping. I mean, it's a, these are ins insulating materials, so there is some barrier anyway to for them. Yeah. Yes. Follow up on that. How do you actually embed charges in in a material? And when you when you say embedding charges, are these overall electrically neutral or uh, charged? Yeah. <clears throat> so. Well, okay, I'll answer in two different ways. First question is that what they do typically is that they, there are two ways to do this, two main ways that I know of. One way, the older way was that you take a needle, put it inside the material, in one of the holes, for example. You apply a very large electric field to break down the air, right, to produce charges, to deposit charge. That's one way to do it. The, uh, what my former postdoc has been doing is that he found that, for example, for really soft material, it's very hard to stabilize. So he takes a very thin Teflon layer, and they break down the air, and they quickly glue it on the other soft material on top of it. So the, ch the charge is trapped by the Teflon, the stiff Teflon layer and the soft material. So they, they, they play tricks like this to stabilize them. Now, talking about overall, neut overall uh, neutrality, so people will sometimes say that they're putting not just dipoles, but actually charges, but I think it's just kind of wrong. At some level, the entire material has to be neutral, otherwise the energy is too high. Remember, the electrical energy is, goes all the way to infinity, right? It goes to vacuum, it's be too much for it. So even if you think about it, let's look at a, sorry, here. You, if you have a charge layer here, let's say put it's a, just negative charge, for example, your electrode overall the material will has to be neutral, right? Will be neutral because it will deposit some charges on each electrode. Overall, you'll have like balance. You'll just have giant dipoles in the end. That's essentially what you'll have. Good question. Uh, the hearing work that, that was really fascinating. Have you uh, did you try and see if if that can sort of predict what is the what is believed to be the common human range of hearing frequency, if that somehow. Uh, so the, our model is at a very basic level. Uh, we would so we, for example, only analyze uh, one stereocilia, right? Because we are trying to do some very basic, interesting predictions on these things. So each, so in some sense. You have, you have a hair bundle, you have serious cilia. Each of them is responsible for some sort of a frequency. And then, you know, so you have multiple cells. That's why we have this range, right? So I don't think this phenomenon will explain that because it really is a function of how, what, how many hair cells you have and how many serious cilia you have, right? That will decide your frequency range. But assuming, let's say it's about the same for, it is about the, roughly the same for most human beings, then how well it works, that is what we explain. The sound amplification, the frequency discrimination, the compressive nonlinearity, all that stuff. Yeah. So we are most interested in the ability to disting distinguish the pitches, maybe more. Yeah. Okay. You and then you. Yeah. You go first. So I'm supposing if I have all the permanent dipoles embedded in an elastomer, and then I do a homogenization and they are everywhere. That, that would give me a linear homogenization that would give me totally zero force, isn't that right? If you don't take a bandic of a nonlinearity. Yeah, if, if basically, it's even if you, for, let's forget about electromagnetism, just look at elasticity. So if you have residual stresses in a body, the effective elastic modulus doesn't change in the linear setting, right? It's unaffected. Only when you no, start with a nonlinear, so it's, or, or in other words, body forces. If you have body forces, and uh, you do, you, you, they, do, they will not impact in a, in a linear setting to your effective elastic modulus. You have to go into a nonlinear uh, regime. Then maybe you can linearize if you like to. If you do analytical work, then you'll get it, yeah. So I, I, I thought I was asking that question because I was like, okay, if you're gonna design this kind of material, then don't you need to make sure in the experiment that you have a permanent bulk dipole moment 
for yeah, you are break, you're right, but you, you are breaking symmetry, right? The, so if you think about this, in fact, that's this formula it actually tells you. If you did not have a difference in the elastic modulus, you would not break the symmetry, and then you'll get zero. So th that, that some sort of elastic variation is necessary, or actually dielectric variation. We didn't, uh, this this uh, mo sim model is too simple, but you can actually, we have a regress homogenization theory that shows that, uh, I, I skipped it actually, uh, but we have a regress homogenization theory. So here's an example. Let us say there's no dielectric contrast. We can strictly prove that the effective piezoelectric tensor ha is proportional to the elastic contrast. It has to be. That is the only way you can ensure some breaking of symmetry there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Wait, Nima and then Dalit. Yeah, you go. Just a very quick one. So is there a way to apply temperature in a way nonlinearly that you get thermoelectric effect out of this? Uh, actually, there is. In, in, uh, interestingly, I believe so. There, there is. A, so, my the former postdoc is actually working on a, with a semiconductor setting, and looking at how the the, the, the ionic flow is going, uh, the thermoelectric mechanism will be impacted by this. I, it's too early to say whether we'll get something interesting or not, but it should be. We don't know whether how big it is or not. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Love it. General question, or actually a comment. Uh, you you use several words, flexible electricity, the leader electricity, many, many different combinations of these. I get confused. Is there an underlying broad theory of coupling of mechanics with electricity and magnetism, of which all of these are special cases? Uh, I, I, yes. Are we stuck with the special cases? No, no, there are. There is. There is, there is a general theory. If I think, I don't know if anybody has been motivated enough to write it down, but uh, in fact, the recent work that we did on magnetoelectricity of the hard materials, which I was discussing with you, that is, has, should have all the elements, elasticity, magnetism, and electricity, and all these things will... Ionic motion we did not do in that paper, but it can be in, in yeah no but no yeah no I don't think anybody has this giant <laughs> big theory because it becomes too cumbersome. No, it becomes cumbersome, but just looking at special cases also perhaps helps you extract what are the broad underlying principles. Right? Yes, the, the, so for uh, intrinsic in materials that are intrinsically magnetoelectric or piezoelectric, you can write a general theory. There's no issues. Uh, but the, what we are doing here is a little bit different in the sense that we are trying to create artificial materials that are actually not. So in that sense, we have to kind of uh, deal with a special theory, right? We are trying to put charges there, do this and that, so that way we get this effect out of something out of nowhere. That's really where the, uh, what, why I have to kind of do it case by case basis. And the strategy is different. But to your point, if I, so if tell me that something is magnetoelectric or piezoelectric, if I want to write a phenological theory that includes everything, that's not a problem. That should be okay. Maybe not the motion part, because that's a dissipative system, then you will have to do a little bit more mach different machinery, but that is also possible. Uh, I just can't keep track of all the <laughs> different subsets of this company. <laughs> Great, just you. Thanks. Uh, very interesting uh, work. And uh, you were saying try to reduce the last modulus, and I was thinking, why not the liquids? Right? But then I think I realized you know you're mostly talking about elastic displacement. So I, I wonder, you know, uh, what happens if there is an elastic definition? And also if you make the modulus very soft, right? I mean low dimension materials uh, in the like the button region where they have near the zero modulus. And in fact this uh fold you showed that you have this yeah. bulk of elements and I just wonder, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, a couple of things you mentioned there, there, all of them have some interesting aspect to it. You, let's talk about buckling, for example, or instabilities. Absolutely. In fact, I just saw something that uh, Lalit was doing in instability. Those, all this could be used to create interesting features. Absolutely. That's one. That has been in inadequately explored so far. I think that's a really good topic. The second one, actually, for the fluids, let's say liquids, not, not the gases, the liquids. You can have flex electricity. I mean, you, you were talking, you were talking about uh, you know, shear at point, point, but uh, in fact, uh, my, I read a paper, an old Russian paper, 
that show that if you apply uh, you, if you apply some sort of a shock kind of a wave can lead to something a phenomena called sonoluminescence. I have forget, uh, so. Uh, he, yeah, he was attributing the, the electrical activity to flexoelectricity. So I, that, so I don't know enough about it yet. I have to, I'm still trying to figure it out whether there is some relationship or not. But there is, there is some possibility this, it could happen. But instabilities, definitely so. That, that will be a big, uh, big thing. Other inelastic mechanisms. So the hard materials, typically the ones people have dealt with, they don't, they don't have much plastic deformation. They have dislocations, but not plastic deformation. And the soft material, Inelasticity mechanisms. I think I don't think they. Ha I don't. I don't. I haven't seen much work on that either. Uh, but if that is possible. I mean, viscoelasticity, of course, would be a natural thing that Lalit is doing. Yeah. That. Great. I think I actually have a question. But I'm not going to ask it because otherwise we'll come back for another hour. Um, but I, th I think we are. We are we. Lots of time. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Pradeep, again, sure. and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.